Hey boys and girls, David Vos here. I cannot even, well I was almost going to say it. I was going to say I can't believe it, but that's not supposed to be in my vocabulary. Boy, that's a hard habit to break, you know. Language, it took me quite a while to stop saying G-O-D. Like it just would just keep coming out of my mouth. And, and I think that was an important step, but I'm right now almost through with the word unbelievable. I don't even like saying, well, I believe because I don't want to have any beliefs. I guess there are people that do. I did, I guess, I, if that's what you want to call them. I, I'd rather call them doctrines, teachings. I had teachings, which is completely different from truths. Truths are established facts. But here's the thing. There are truths that are not yet established. So that's not even what truth is. But yeah, religions like Jehovah's Witnesses will say something like that. You know, it's established facts. Well, who who established this fact? I'm going to be the one establishing it. I am the knower. And no one can be the knower for me. And if you know something, then that's why you must give your testimony. So you received Jesus. You saw him. You recognized him on the road to Jerusalem after the resurrection. And now you must go and tell others. But even the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the greatest testimony there ever was, who came down from on high and emptied himself and took on the form of a slave. And understand what that means. He did not take on the form of a human. He took on the form of a slave because humans are not slaves. But the condition of humankind today is slavery. Why? Because we're all bound under the law. And friends, what is the law? The Apostle Paul tells us, you know, some of you out there, <laughs> hint, hint, sons of God ministries. Paul was an apostle. And he gave his testimony. And he said that the law is a curse and a bondage. So man was made on the sixth day and Elohim said and proclaimed, it is very good. There was no death. There was no temptation. There were some living creatures and we're going to tell you what they looked like. They had wings. Dragons and unicorns. Yes, that fantasy world. Fairies, elves and gnomes. These all dwelled there. And we will prove this from the Bible. But this dragon, this unicorn, which were two of these creatures that stood near to the throne of the divine being to protect them. The Egyptians called them Behemoth and Tiamat. And in our Hebrew, it's come down as Tiom and Bohol, Behomoth, you know, the void, which is empty space or spatial, physical material, and Tiamat, which is time, Timol, which is where they translated void. Void meaning there's no time. So time and space was all that existed on the waters. And out from the waters, after the division of the dry land and the waters, there were the two things. And there became the seraphim, seraph meaning serpent, the two serpents, that had six wings each that spread their wings around the throne. The one half was the devil and the other half was Jesus. They were the reigning kings over their prospective sides, the dual side. They were two brothers, Cain and Abel. But Cain wasn't evil. 
and neither is Satan. Yahweh's not evil. He simply dwells in the darkness and his nature is from the darkness and that's the other side of the light. And the darkness is the beginning, the chaos from where we began, where we did not yet have eyes to see. And the lower ego does not know about the higher spiritual because it hadn't happened yet. It's the future. It's the advancement. And so Yahweh reigns over this world. His law is immortal. It is eternal. It is holy and it is good. But it is a curse and a bondage. And it's that way for a reason. So his law took the reality that was made the patterns of the, the spiritual bodies of light and the immortal beings or the living creatures and the paradise and cut it in half and laid upon it a law and said, you will not become like the divine until after you have been cursed. You must die first. I am the avenger. I am the tester. I am the bottom of the wheel. We go through the classroom. When you graduate, you go on to the higher worlds. And so, when that time existed, the unicorns were mythical because the, the world was cursed. Our Heavenly Father did not curse the world, but he had two children, both were necessary. We have the spirit and the physical. And the spiritual and the physical. If there is a spiritual one, there's also a physical one, the Apostle Paul says. And that which is made alive is not made alive unless first it dies. We came from the depths, from the deep, from the eternal waters that were there at the void and the emptiness or where there was time and space, not at all, before the creation or the manifestation. Or you could look at it as the moment of distinction. It had already existed as a possibility, but we hadn't thought of it. We hadn't imaged it. We hadn't learned it. We hadn't become and lived in it and thought about it grasped it, identified it, named it. It was all within us. We came from the deep where the seed lies, the infinite child or baby or, 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 or embryo that comes from our divine mother, the eternal virgin. But at that point, only the ego was aware. But the of course, all of the awareness had to have already been for all eternity or else we wouldn't have had immortality. So the Divine Mother and Divine Father existed in all of eternity in that paradise. But it happened in a state of natural progression. It all came from the Divine Holy Mother. She wasn't imperfect. She hadn't sinned. She's the Eternal Virgin. We're not talking about this creation the physical carnal world, but we're talking about the physical holy world. The paradise was made on day one, two, three, four, five, six, and was to become rested and finished by the seventh day. It was on the seventh day, though, while it was still proceeding, when we were supposed to have perfection and we were all done. It's all finished. And it was very good that the lower ego, or I should say the first, signs of consciousness, the first signs of awareness that come from the lower realms because they open their petals first in this dynamic progression that continues on for all of eternity. And wherever you are, you're in the middle and everything in the past is infinite and all that will be in the future is an infinite and he dwells in unapproachable light. But everything, as we discern here, as we're trying to tell the story, we say everything that was before the middle was lower than the top half and therefore lesser. And therefore its understanding was lesser. And that understanding was kind of a prison for it because it didn't know 
or wasn't aware that it could fly yet. So it was bound by its own consciousness. And it said, I am deity, and I'm the only one, and there is none but me, and I am vengeance, and I'm angry. Well, that was an instinctual nature that said, work hard, go and try to become, you know, fight your way to the top, because we didn't have wisdom yet. But a higher awareness was in the womb still. Everything always existed from the beginning, but in this physical realm, nothing was manifest of the higher. It was only the lower part that was still learning. It was a painful birth. But when the woman gave birth, and after the pain was over, she was glorified and was adorned with the sun and crowned with a crown of 12 stars. And all these natures that came from her that she created became exalted by the birth of the divine son that she gave birth to through her struggle. She was initiated into this struggle. And when she was there in the garden, she was there with her husband and all was perfect. There was the higher mind, the precognition, the will, and there was the lower consciousness and the seeking of wisdom and the analyzer and the observer. Now, the observer hadn't observed everything yet, so it didn't yet know everything. And so she was innocent when she partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that she might become like deity, not knowing that she had been separated in her being from her husband. They were to be one. And in this union of Adam and Eve, who were there, right there in this divine garden that, mind you, was not made by our Heavenly Father and Divine Mother because our Heavenly Father and Divine Mother were in Adam and Eve. That was the form that our Divine Father and Divine Mother had taken. The two opposite sides of the progenitors of all the universe. And when they were together, holding hands and making love, and giving birth to all of the living creatures in the universe and not wondering and questioning anything, but simply going and walking hand in hand, the higher will enamored by the beauty of the physical, its images and its wisdom and its pleasures. And they were in a rapt a orgasmic dance. But inside of them both were various realms and places that needed exploration. They needed to reach the heights and therefore comprehend the depths. They needed to understand the bitter before they could understand the sweet. But it was not the higher mind that initiated this questioning, reasoning, observing. The conscious mind did that. Innocent as though it is, it was deceived, which is a natural thing. It didn't know yet. It had to partake of knowledge in order to know, and that is the gnosis. And that was given to both the man and the woman. They both partook. But Adam, or the will, wasn't deceived. But the conscious nature, which didn't have access to the higher nature, it got separated because the lower ego, in its blindness, the lower side separated itself because it did not yet have attainment unto the higher knowledge. It needed to go through the gnosis. This was a natural process, an evolutionary, transmigratory, eternal progression that the two sides of the whole had to learn and have sex. They had to share each other and know each other. And in order to do that, sometimes they had to disagree. And there were times when even the Apostle Paul says, it's best to, by mutual consent, spend time alone in prayer and fasting. And they did. And this is what we're doing. This is the prayer and fasting. We're all going to be one for all of eternity, but we're just spending a little while separate. The conscious mind, without knowing the future or the consequences yet, 
We need to learn and know for ourselves. So, there in this garden was a man and a woman. Those are the two only beings that were there. Because remember, Jesus told us that the divine being dwelleth in us. And so the divine being was there in Adam and Eve. But in Adam and Eve was also the serpent. Because our divine creator that's within us had already made all of the different things. It made a universe. It made these living creatures and they were all perfect in their respective spheres of influence. Every graduation had its perfection. There were classes. There were ranks. And of course, within each house, there were other ranks and angels. And there was a whole chorus. When the divine being which is the higher mind, the light, the consciousness, of the divine consciousness, manifested and created the universe. It was the whole universe, left and right, male and female. And he then came in and dwelled in them and lived through his creation. So he was there. And all the living creatures, there were four living creatures that were the four divisions of creation. There were the lion, the bull, the eagle, and the man. The lion is the king of all the animals that are wild. The bull is the king of the domestic animals. The eagle is the king of the birds in the sky. And man is the king of all of them. It's a graduating ascent through these natures. The Apostle Paul described it differently, a little bit differently. He uses four different animals in his symbol. He said it is the fish and then the birds and then the mammals and then the men. So Genesis chapter 1, which is the creation of all things, is characterized as a graduating ascent of animal souls that started with fish and then moved up to the animals, and or I should say moved up to the birds and then the animals, and then to the crowning of the creation. And it was Adam who had a special relationship with these other animals because he named them. He comprehended them. He was the crowning creation, the one who would have dominion. The divine being told Adam, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and the animals that roam around on the earth. So this was a unified thing, and they were all together. And this is the four living creatures, and the 24 elders, the whole creation. Everything manifest the creation, all that was created on day one, day two, all the way to the end of that creation. The one who has dominion was Adam and Eve. They named the animals. But Genesis chapter 2 is another, I won't say creation because the word creation is not used there, but a forming. He formed Adam from the dust of the lower elements. He formed. And they began to form of the dust all these animals. This is the lower nature. And then he made a law and tempted. And this is all coming from another perspective, from the lower ego. I am, and that is my name, and I am vengeance, and I am jealous, and I am just this puny little ignorant fool who is blind. I create light and darkness because I don't know, but I'm jealous and I'm angry. And I put a law, which is a curse, and cursed is everyone who hangeth upon a tree, which means when you're punished and sentenced to death for disobeying this world, then you are done. You finished the job. You've gotten out. You paid the price. You've given your life. You willingly said no. That's blasphemy. You must reject the devil. You must grow out of it. 
wake up and open up and recognize the Christ within you. It's not that it never was there and you're just making it up. It was always there, but you weren't aware of him. You didn't believe. And that came, that gnosis, came through experience, partaking of knowledge, being baptized. That's the initiation process. To be baptized down into the waters on the bottom of the wheel through the three days of night, through death, through the initiation, to become enlightened, to recognize the Christ that will rise on the horizon and brighten up the day. So yes, we're going through darkness, which is just simply a consciousness of not knowing, dark. We don't know yet. We're progressing. But the Lord provided a little moon there for us. Our Heavenly Father did not curse us. But we, because we were deceived by the lower flesh, which is a natural process, we had to die in order that we might live, we were cursed. And what was actually cursed? Well, Yahweh was there in the garden, and so was a serpent, along with Adam and Eve. These two are the two different serpents that were there, the, the two seraphim. If you look in the Sumerian and the Babylonian text, it says there were two of these. It's kind of like when Moses went up the mountain. He went up Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb. Well, he didn't see the form of the divine because the divine being doesn't have form. Yahweh has form. Yahweh uh, showed, well, deity showed Moses his backside. You ever wonder what that means? It means there's, there's two sides of the universe. The backside is the darkness, the ignorance. And that's all Moses saw was the ignorance. And he wrote it down. It's called the law, the curse. We had to understand that side in order to understand the good side. We had to be deceived in order to be enlightened. So everything's divided into two. You got Adam and Eve. Eve is the part that is going to be aware, is going to partake of this initiation, the physical. And she's going to get separated for a while. They're going to go on hiatus and they're going to get a psychic problem. They're not going to be able to, to understand everything. This way they can cut the universe up into different parts and, and experience all of it down into the depths. They can sin. In the perfect universe, in paradise, there is no sin. But in order for there to be free will, we have to have some place where we can make mistakes. Trial and error. Not the perfect world, right? But in the world where we go on our own and make our own little illusions so we can learn. When the Bible says man and woman is one, it's really saying there's only one being. And we're not good or evil. We're not male or female. We're the one being. But we separate ourselves into all these variables in order to understand everything. And through that comes birth. And so birth could not have happened without the separation. The separation could not have happened without the Yahweh who deceived us. And therefore, without sin, there could not have been any birth. You see, there could not have been Adam and Eve producing and becoming many. So when our Elohim said, become many and have dominion, he was literally saying, you're going to have variables. Therefore, you're going to be split in your psyche. And from the two is going to become the many. And he was ordaining this process. So, the true reality, there is no sin, there is no evil, there is no pain. But we don't live there forever, all the time. We live in a beautiful home. We've got a beautiful plush bed, white cotton sheets. We've got a beautiful rock fireplace to keep us warm. We might even have servants to keep the wood coming and, 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 and draw in the water for our bath. We live in this beautiful place with fur rugs, candles, and vermouth to drink with our dinner. 
We are kings. We have it all and nothing ever goes wrong. But we only go in there to rest. That's the, the, the perfect rest to enter into his rest. We don't rest all the time. Sometimes we come out like Jesus said, my father keeps on working and I keep on working. I'll go rest when I'm done. The rest was made for me, not me for the rest. I'll rest when I'm tired. Okay, I got a sheep down here and needs to get out of the well. And I'm going to keep working till I get him out, till we make salvation, till I learn, till I get it. We can't go into the rest of the Holy Heavenly Father and Divine Mother until we have achieved everything that is to be achieved in these six days. And on the seventh day, we'll enter into his rest. But when we've rested, then we'll get our work clothes on. We'll put on this animal manger that's dressed in swaddling bands of white linen. But it's this holy child placed in this animal manger, a barn, this carnal world. And it will go through the Herod trying to kill all the babies and going down into Egypt of these lower realms where they're building these four-sided pyramids and have all these laws and the Pharaoh does not know Joseph and we're persecuted. But the entire way, our divine father protects us and parts the Red Sea. And we go on to dry ground and all the demons and the devil's armies are lost in the sea and destroyed. And that's the unconscious abyss that's locked away and they're gone. We go and we conquer the land and we build the grand city of peace. The, the city is a place where we establish law and order and happiness. We achieve, we get to the pinnacle. So we have two creations. Our heavenly father is the first creation, which is the eternal one, because it's the reality. The other one's just an illusion, but it happens second. The first death and the second death. And whoever has part in the first resurrection has no part in the second death. The first resurrection is enlightenment. And then we get the eternal immortality. But the first death is spiritual, and then we die physically. And so we had to die. And so we were alive forevermore. But now we're here in a temporary illusion. It's part of the process. There are seven days. We have to enter into his rest by going through the gradual advancement. Why? If we were created perfect, if we're immortal, we have it all from the beginning. Why are we now going through this Yahweh and, and this lie and this curse and this death? Because we couldn't comprehend everything we had. We had this beautiful bed. We had a, a, a jacuzzi bath and a warm fireplace and all the food and the rum you could drink. And we sat around dancing and playing songs. We had so much fun. But eventually we had to go hunting. Because you got to renew your energy. You sleep and rest and have fun, recreation, restoration. But then there's a time to go work. There's a time to die. There's a time to wake. There's a time to work. And there's a time to dance. And there's a time to mourn. We do this because we want to learn. We want to understand fully all that we actually have. We got this sweet drink we call wine or whatever. Makes us happy and merry. But we're like, what? I don't know that I'm merry because I've never had suffering. It's an adventure. Just that's why I, you see people that want to watch scary movies or thrillers or whodunits. We don't know who done it. It's a mystery. Mysteries. <laughs> the Bible's a mystery. It's a drama. It's a, the world is a stage. Nothing can ever happen to you. You're in the divine father and mother's arms. You're immortal. You already made that way. You're just coming down here to experience evil and taste of death in order to know fully what life is. And so the next step or the 
forming was just an illusion. It's not the eternal world. It's just a place that we go. And every time we go out, we build a different world, another circumstance. You're me and I'm you. We all are one, really. But I'm me over here and in this space and in this time. And you're me over there in that space and that time. You're in that consciousness and I'm in this conscious. But we're all the I am. Even Yahweh is the I am. He is vengeance and he is suffering. So, the true creation then is not the creation you're seeing here. You've seen a horse, but they don't have a horn in the middle of their forehead. You've seen dragons, but only in art, mythology, right? In the Bible. I used to wonder why it says in the book of Revelation, I saw a great red dragon, seven heads and ten horns. And then it says, this is the original serpent. I'm like, well, if it's the original serpent, why don't you just say it's a serpent? Why is this serpent now a big dragon? Well, because the dragon is in the heavens. It's controlling the beast on earth. And the serpent was cursed to be slithering on the ground on its belly. The wings were taken from it. This dragon represents one of these seraphims with the six wings. But that half of the creation, that one seraphim lost his wings. And he was sent down to hell. And you know who that was? It was Jesus. And he's the firstborn among many brethren. So it's all of us. We lost our wings. We became the slithering serpent. Yeah, we're the good guys. We're the ones being cursed here. And this is why when Jesus came, he... He said, come and follow me and take up your cross. Because that serpent was nailed to a cross. And everyone who looked upon the serpent received salvation. And so the Bible says that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so whoever looks upon the Son of Man, nailed upon that cross as the serpent, has eternal life. What does that mean? A simple confession, you know, Om dunk in the water three times, say amen in the name of Jesus, and then get to your holy laying on of hands and go through these ceremonies, get sprinkled by the priest, take the wafer, abracadabra, voila, call you in the morning, everything's going to be fine. No, it isn't about ceremonies. It's not about rituals. It's not about the outside of the cup. It's not about keeping laws. You can't earn your way. Don't matter how much you know, it's what you know internally. It's when you hear the Holy Spirit, the inside within you, trust in, in, the, in the whispering of that serpent who says, yes, don't worry. You've got to learn for yourself, make your own decisions to become like the divine being. You can't be uh, a little animal that you put a bit in its mouth and you control it. I don't want you to be a goat. Basically, I don't want you to be a serpent, but you are a serpent and I love you. What? Because the serpent had wings. That was the creation. The whole creation, it was, it was beautiful. It was mythical. It's the reality. Yeah. In, in, the, in the realm of the divine, in, in the eternal paradise, there are no mosquitoes that sting you and cause pain. There are no serpents that bite you. Vipers. The brood of vipers are these individuals on earth that got the law that their deity is the devil, which is just a deceiver. And the serpent is the creation. It's our physical bodies. It's all the animals. They've been ruined. It's a different environment, ecology. They don't have wings anymore. They bite you. They're poison. They're vipers. And Pegasus no longer has that unihorn. Now, the Egyptians used to call these two, as I said, Beomoth and Leviathan. And they stood around the divine throne. And today, when you look up the pole star, that's where the divine throne is. Jesus is Polaris, or the phoenix bird that's rising right now to make the ascendancy. It's right in the center, and everything revolves around Jesus. But around Jesus, that north star, is the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper. And in Egyptian, that was the Behemoth or the 
rhino with the one horn and the alligator, but they had wings. The alligator had wings. It was a serpent who had legs like an alligator and wings. So some say it was the alligator, but I don't believe it was. I think that there was a mythical creature that wasn't really an alligator. Alligators are still cursed. They're still dangerous and vicious. The original dragon was harmless. You know, like Puff the Magic Dragon. They were, they were beautiful creatures. They didn't do any harm. They're the serpent that's talked about in Isaiah where it says that, I think it's Isaiah 35 where it says, the lamb shall lie down with the wolf and the lion will eat straw like the bull. And the little child, which is the holy Christ self, shall dwell in the hole of the cobra, the serpent, and it will do no harm. There's no viper there at all. In all my holy mountain, it will do no harm. Meaning the physical creation will not be harmful. There won't be mosquitoes biting you, bugs biting you. The world is cursed. Our creation's under a curse. So yeah, there's a physical change. Do I think that dragons and unicorns used to exist? Yes, I do. Well, like I said, there's still rhinos, but that rhino doesn't have wings. But I'll tell you, one side of the of this peripheral around the throne is the dark and the other side is the light. There's the left and the right, the male and the female. And so these two seraphim each have six wings in their glorified living condition, immortal condition. But one of them was thrown down from heaven. That was Jesus. Banned and cursed because he was a blasphemer because he wanted to raise his throne above the other stars. Well, yeah, he was already there. He was the son of deity. Nearest unto the Lord, who is his divine mother and divine father. And all of faithful at his right hand. The 24 elders and the 144,000 and the whole company or the choir or the orchestra of creation was all there. And they were mythical and beautiful and they did no harm and they had wings. But on one side was the depths and one side was the height. So the depths was the sea. We're on land looking at this. We've got Two things, up and down from land, from the middle. And the depths is where we came from. And that's where the hippo and the rhino uh, dwell in the marshes, wallowing in the mud. And the alligators down there too. So half of this holy being, this beautiful, dynamic, serpent with feathers when he was thrown down into hell he went down into the depths of the water so the unicorn and the dragon represent creation in its mythical beauty in its pristine perfection which is completely unlike the world you see today where alligators don't have wings and horses don't have wings or horns they're not exalted they were thrown down in both the, the, the alligator and the behemoth or in the swamp in the depths, the male and the female, the, the, the left and the right, the universe is, is cursed under the law because Yahweh cursed the serpent. He cursed the woman. He cursed the ground for man's sake so it would not produce but thorns and thistles. The curse of the woman was that she should have birth pains and be in subjection to her husband. She was a slave. Adam was a slave to the ground. And then he cursed the serpent. See, Yahweh's the guy doing all the cursing, not the serpent. The serpent is something we need to emulate because Jesus said, I want you to be wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. We got to do both. We got to have both sides. We need to temper our power with wisdom. Our discipline with love. The universe in its perfect state is the most beautiful thing and it has a rainbow with all the colors. And in the center of the rainbow there is a mushroom or at the holy tree of life. But it's the pegasus that leads you there. The Indians used to say it was these little deer they would see a deer in the path and they would follow the deer. 
A raven was a bad sign, but it was mythological. It was telling you that we're all in this world seeking the mystery in all of this physical world. There's a way out. The Bible says he shows us the way out of every trial. There's always a way out. And he won't let us bear more than what we can suffer. This is not punishment. This is discipline because he disciplines those whom he loves. And we're all going through this graduation. He so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's us. That we might die, nor that we might live. It's not about human sacrifice. That's the devil that wants that. Our Heavenly Father paid that price and his son Jesus Christ paid that price and we all paid the price in order to have life we all must take up our cross and follow him so along with the trial he'll give us the way out so here's the world this is the trial the maze we're running a race that we might gain the prize Paul says well with everything that happens, you've got to be able to figure it out. Oh, something happened. The door just closed. Satan resisted me, Paul said. He understood it was all symbolic. It was all a spiritual process. Nothing's happening to you, but that you are not willing it or agreeing to it. And if you don't agree, you say, in, in, in Jesus' name, get the hint and it will obey you. You have the power over scorpions and serpents, but you have to understand that you need higher consciousness to access it and there is a portal and that portal is somewhere in creation in certain mother goose rhymes or whatever it's always this mushroom and there is a salamander or a serpent in this garden with a fern and so forth usually pegasus or a fairy leads us there and we get to this mushroom and, and we partake of the mushroom and we go unto the higher realms and we see the lord that's the way out, higher consciousness, meditation, fasting, and understanding, gnosis. So in the Babylonian, Assyrian, Akkadian, they talk about cannabis. The Judeans use cannabis. The temple of Artemis, which was made by Elijah, who went up there and established the school of the prophets. They used the honey. Jesus used the honey that was made from the daffodil. And his priestesses were called honey bees because they brought the honey and all work together for the salvation of man. We all work for our queen mother because the queen mother was beautiful. She's creation and she's not cursed, but she provides us the spiritual honey. And we partake of the Melissi or the priesthood of the Essenes. That's what they were called and the individual holy virgins were called the Melissi and they brought the honey. And so when you read there after the resurrection that they were on this road walking along and all depressed and they saw this man walking around and he asked them why they were all depressed. He said, well, haven't you heard? Our Lord just died. And he go, oh, really? Hmm, tell me more. Why don't you sit down and I'll make you some food. And Jesus gave them fish and honey. And when they ate from the honey and broke the bread, it says their eyes were opened and they recognized him. See, we've got to partake of this honey and the bread, which is the communion. The honey was in the wine. They spiked it. Even the rabbis will tell you that even on Passover, they spiked the wine. It was a holy communion. And we went through the Passover and we're going to be going through the Passover in order to get to the communion with the holy angels. And we get to the communion by having wisdom. And our divine mother has made this entire beautiful creation of advancement. We follow each and every one of these creatures because they are like little gnomes and the elves. They, they, they have some wisdom and they guide us like the serpent who says, partake, be courageous and strong and you will become awakened and recognize along the trail, you'll recognize the Christ by eating from the honey, which has been provided for you by our divine heavenly father who will not make a trial unless he gives you the way out. Friends, no matter what you're going through, stop and understand that Jesus is, is, is in control.
Nothing in your life could be going on without Jesus knowing it. And if Jesus wants you to suffer, like, oh, lose your car because you didn't have the money to pay for it, then just say, thank you, Lord. Because guess what? You're getting ready to get some way better gift as long as you can say thank you. Because we enter into the gates with thanksgiving and into his presence with praise upon our lips. Give thanks for everything and it will all be fine. Even if you're eating poison, say a blessing over it, it cannot hurt you. If you have faith, if you cut your leg off, if you had faith, it will grow back immediately. You'll tell that mountain to be moved, but you simply have to realize that. And sometimes that only comes through prayer and fasting and being initiated into the great truth and wisdom that you might have understanding or knowing. And through your faith, you will overcome all these things and be glorified. So you remember the movie, The Avatar. In that movie, they had this beautiful tree. It seemed like everything was revolving around this tree. It was full of light and they would touch it and they gained life. They were connected with nature. But this technological advancement from Earth was coming and destroying their, their habitat and trying to cut down the tree. They're taking the life away from them. That's what they're doing. We need to go back to the mythical creation of the unicorn and the dragon because they are beautiful. And they're not under the curse. And it's right there. They're the immortal reality that's always been there. We're in a delusion right now. All you gotta do is reach out your hand and touch that tree of life. Just touch Christ and you'll be well. But you remember in that movie, they had these almost look like pterodactyls, like the one on your screen. And they would ride them and they would connect with the hair or somehow. They would sort of like almost plug in, connect with it. They were like one with this beautiful, magnificent creature. It wasn't evil. It wasn't ferocious. It was simply a vehicle. They were one with all of creation. They were one with the tree of life and the pterodactyl or the dragon or the unicorn. They were one with all of life and they were happy. And that's today, that's just a cartoon world, an afterthought, a fantasy. It'll never happen. But friends, I'm telling you, it, it will. We are destined to see this with a lamb lie down with a wolf and the lion eats straw like the bull. There will not be any more serpents without wings. The serpents will be dragons and we'll ride them through the sky. And unicorns and Pegasus will come and water at the brook. And we'll go on and get on top of Pegasus. And we won't just go through the forest, but she'll take us to heights that we've never experienced before in all of our imagination. It will be the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And I'm not just imagining this. I'm telling you this is what the Bible teaches. We read the scripture that says that the curse that Yahweh put through the law, through the guilt, through this delusion, that he put upon the creation, he took the lowest form and he took away its wings. We're in the lowest form of creation and it's been disabled, it's been cursed, but not really. It's just a deception. You get your wings back as soon as you understand the Lord loves you. As soon as you open up your eyes and recognize that Christ is already within you. And he died from the founding of the world. I think it's a beautiful thing. And I see we're only, well, not even 50 minutes And instead of going on and on and making this a long, long video, I think maybe I'll just leave it here. I think we've got quite a revelation to ponder. And then we'll talk to you guys some more about this and put some of this together so that we can not only understand it, but we can practice it.
and we can pass over from death to life and truly do the greater works that Jesus promised us we would do and be like the stars that shine for their brightness that lead the many to righteousness. You know, we've been talking about how the Bible makes it look like the only one that's going to get any salvation is these Judeans and they got to keep all the law. And Paul says, ha, fake out. That's not really true. You can't keep the law. And if you do that, you're going to die. Well, we've just tried to explain why all this process happened. Why the ego, the Yahweh, thought he was deity and why we believed him and how he's a liar. So we found that the chosen ones are really the nations and Jesus was a pagan. And the Judeans and their Messiah, they shall receive him. He'll come in his own name. And they will die in their sins. And it will be more tolerable for Sodom and for Gomorrah than it will be for them. Woe unto the Jehovah's Witnesses and woe unto the modern prosperity gospel and woe unto the deceivers and those fleecing the flock and those twisting the scriptures and to the Sitchins and to the Vandanikins and to the George Norries who are plastering the world with all of their nonsense and the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society with their evil pamphlets and their evil wicked lies. Woe unto them all. And yet, no matter who you are, even if you are a Pharisee of the Pharisees trying to persecute the Christians, consenting to the death of Stephen, on the road to Damascus to take them out. The Lord came to him and the scales fell off his eyes after he had been blind to show that he would was blind that his whole knowledge of things was in error and he was truly persecuting not the enemy but the Lord himself. And so, not only is Rome have the Melchizedek priesthood, which is higher than the Judeans, but they had the lineal descendant of one line of the Jews, which is through Zerah. And they also, through Samson, went up and married and made a union with the line of Cain back to the Enoch from Cain and Lamech and the Phoenicians. And they unified the flesh and the spirit and they became one. And this holy priesthood was taken and brought down to Alexander the Great and into the Caesars and into Jesus. But not only then were they counting their lineage from Samson or Hercules, as the Greeks called him, and then back to Uranus or Noah. But when Samson went up there to Sidon and married the Philistine Delilah and unified that priesthood, and their children went from there to Crete and to the Spartans and to all of Greece, by the way, they spoke a special language. The area up around northern Italy where Dan, who married Delilah, the Phoenician, brought the holy priesthood, they called that area Arcadia or the Peloponnesian Islands or the Paradise. And they began a civilization there and they spoke a language called Etruscan. And the great priesthood all were taught in that day to speak Etruscan. But the peasants didn't know how to speak the language. 
And that was the language that spoke the truth. If you could learn the Etruscan language, you would learn secrets that would blow your mind. Many people say that Hebrew is the original language. They're not telling you the truth. They're lying to you. There is no such thing as the language of Hebrew. There was the Canaanites and the Akkadians and the Persians, which is Aramaic. Hebrew is just a people who spoke this Ugaratic Canaanite language, Syriac Aramaic language. And if there was a specific dialect that was called Hebrew, well, we've just called it that recently. But the holy language for thousands of years was the Etruscan language. And only the elite were allowed to even understand it. And today, it is a great mystery. But the language they have for us, the common language, has been deteriorated and confused by Yahweh. And we cannot comprehend truth by the language we have. Like I started this video out saying, I don't use the word unbelievable anymore. And I try not to say G-O-D because that's not even the divine being. I've, when you speak, say this word, what comes to mind is some bearded man up in the cloud with a rainbow or some, some Michelin tire man or something, and that's not what that word means. Completely erroneous. Atonement means covering because we're naked. And Yahweh made us naked and ashamed. And in order for us to feel clothed, we need immortality wrapped around us, not this guilt that Yahweh gave us, not the confusion of Babylon. We need Babel, which is the gate to El. But Yahweh stopped that whole process and threw them out of the garden. They wouldn't partake of the knowledge of good and evil. And so everything that you've been told about the Bible's wrong, there are two Old Testaments. The Old Testament is just preliminary to the new covenant that was established with Jesus. The Old Covenant gives us Two of everything. The first chapter is the real creation of reality. And the second chapter is the illusion where Yahweh creates or, or forms. You have two Noah stories or, or uh, flood stories. One where Yahweh demands that Noah go and get seven of the clean animals because he needed sacrifice. But El tells Noah before that, the chapter before it, to take two, two by two not to take seven animals because he didn't want sacrifice. And so we have these two covenants. Abraham has two meetings with the divine being. One, he meets Yahweh and he goes and slaughters all these animals and Yahweh wants his firstborn son and he wants to, you know, him wants him to sacrifice his own son. The other is where Abraham meets Melchizedek. And by the way, Melchizedek is a Canaanite high priest Elsewhere, he's called Abi Melech or Father Molech. And he makes a eternal and everlasting covenant with Abimelech for a well. And that well is the water that all of us are going to drink, both the Canaanites and the Israelites, which represents the spiritual and the physical coming together, both drinking from the eternal waters of life. And this is why Jesus offered the Samaritan woman eternal living waters bubbling up from her innermost being because he married her and the two became one. But the rabbis will tell you that Rome was literally populated by Esau. Well, that's interesting because no matter where these stories come for, from, where you've got these uh, lineal descendants, one of them's always cursed. We're like, Esau's cursed, but Jacob's blessed, right? But Esau's the firstborn. Well, we think that the blessing went to Jacob, but Jacob had 12 sons and it was the one daughter, Dinah, that really got the blessing. The 12 children were all different tribes and these represent all the natures and the dispositions and attributes of all of his children. But in the end, in order for Joseph who got the blessing, who was the firstborn of his favorite wife, Resh El, not Leah. But Joseph had to marry the Canaanite. And the Canaanite didn't just come from Cain, but also from Jacob, from both. They had to have a child together. So 
Jacob's daughter, Dinah, married Sechem, the Canaanite, and they produced a child named Asenath, and Asenath was the wife of Joseph, of the lineage of all mankind. Just as Joshua and Rahab the harlot from Jericho, the Canaanite, and Judah, who married Tamar, the Canaanite, and all the others who did this, to show us that we need all of the families of earth to become one. That nobody is cursed because they're evil, but because of our ignorance, because they are deceived by this lower ego and the law and vengeance and war. So the rabbis will tell you that Rome was originally Esau. And so Rome ends up with the higher priesthood. We said the other day that Esau, Ishmael, and the Midianites all conformed to confederacy and had one kingdom. And their high priest was Jethro or Ruel, who was the true priesthood that Moses got his blessings and his authority from and took over from where the pharaohs had been reigning. And it was transferred to Moses of the lineage of Esau, Ishmael, Keturah, and Hagar. These blessings were being combined and all the world were receiving their blessings through Abraham, the father of all, the father of faith. So Judah gets a blessing too, but they've got to go through this ignorance. They've got to go through this rejection of Christ. They represent the carnal flesh and they have the law. And they will also receive salvation because Jesus said, Every knee shall bend and every tongue will confess. And it says, but you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. The Judeans will also see him. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. I'm going to go ahead and go. Hope you have a wonderful day. We'll see you tomorrow, guys. Have a good one.